Hi, my name is Jimmy. I've been going to Vineyard for 11 years now, and I fly drones for a living. I work for a company called Skycam USA based out of New York City, and people hire us for various types of uh, aerial production. And what we do is we supply aerial video and aerial photography for productions worldwide. I grew up in New York City, and uh, I didn't really have that entrepreneurial spirit as a child, so I found my self-worth in what I did for a living. I was no longer Jimmy Olivero. I was Jimmy the sales manager, Jimmy the salesman of the month, or, you know, um, whatever I did for a living, that's who I thought I was. But I really wasn't happy. A lot of the companies that I worked for, I just felt like I didn't fit in personality-wise. I didn't fit in, um, you know, I guess, you know, with that company and their mentality sometimes. My buddy came to me in 2006, said he was starting a company, and just really asked me to help out. I didn't really think much of it at the time. I thought it would just be something part-time, but it took over my life uh, and became something more. I got a really good job working uh, in downtown Norfolk for a large uh, marketing and advertising company, and um, I was, he came in as a manager and uh, had a nice salary, full, um, full benefits. My wife was happy with that, um, but the more I was coming into the office every day, I wasn't feeling productive, I didn't feel like I fit in. I started to develop a lot of health issues, anxiety issues, panic attacks, and I was struggling. But in the meantime, the startup was continuing to grow while I was kind of pushing it to the side, trying to make things work for this big company. Um, but I saw that this, you know, the startup was actually growing. And I kind of took a leap of faith. I walked into the office, gave my two weeks notice, and I joined Skycam full time about three years ago and I've never looked back. I love my job, I get to travel the world. Um, I also get to use my vocation uh, for the church and for God's kingdom. I was uh, part of a 35 person team that went to Mazalan, Mexico um, to uh, feed and um, provide medical attention to uh, people in various colonials in this town. And I was able to bring my drones and document what we did from a new perspective. You know, it was just an amazing experience. I get to meet new people in my, uh, in my job. I get to travel. And, uh, you know, sometimes our work is seen on TV. And it's a, that's a reward in itself. I realize that I have to put my faith in Christ and really depend on Him and find myself worth in who He is no matter what job I have. So that's the message I want everybody to have today is to, to you know, love what you do no matter what you do. Honor God in your job. And, uh, you know, God will do mighty things for you. All right, good, good. Well, hello. There you go. Now, uh, before I get started on the message today, uh, I wanted to give you an update. And I'm crooked, I can't be crooked, <laughs> right? Uh, I wanted to give you an update on how Pastor Andy was doing. As he had mentioned last week, uh, he was having some surgery, he had some cancer on his face. And uh, he did go through that surgery, they got all the cancer, it was a no node, if I said that right. So it was a lot of excavation of that area. And so he's going to be out for a couple of weeks, right? And he can't really talk. <laughs> so you need to pray for him because he's a very busy guy. And to sit still, is, it is hard, but he is doing well. And he wanted to make sure I told you, thank you very much for praying for him. All the procedures that he had to go through this week went very well. So thank you for that. We appreciated that, okay? All right, now you also, uh, on the screens at the end, you know how it comes up or on your program, uh, his, uh, was it his email or whatever, Pastor Andy, right? If you wanna talk to him, go ahead and email him. He's got lots of time, okay? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we are gonna continue in our series. For the past seven weeks, we've been in this 50 Days of Transformation series that we've been looking at seven key areas of a person's life, right? So we've looked at the spiritual element, that's what we started, spiritual health, and we looked at physical, mental, emotional, relational health, right? And then last week, uh, Pastor Andy actually looked at the financial health. And today, I want to uh, bring home this final stretch, and we're gonna look at vocational health, vocational health. So how does that work, you know? Well, to be able to understand vocational health, you have to understand that your life work is more important than your job. And let me say that again, your life work is more important than any job that you will have. How come? Because jobs come and go, right? But our life work is that thing that we build on, that's who we are, the essence of who we are, 
and it's built out of a dream that God places in our hearts, okay? And so we need to know that that talks about our purpose for living, that talks about our meaning. So this dream idea, this dream, uh, if you can understand what God is doing in your life, then it really is the key to vocational happiness and health, you know, being able to, to do well in your work. So this dream that I'm talking about is also a gift that God gives us. God gives us humans the ability to remember things from the past and to pull it forward, you know, and those are our memories and stuff. We also gives us the gift of being able to imagine and think about and visualize the future, and that's what I'm calling a dream, okay? He gives us these things to be able to see what isn't. Now, uh, everybody needs a dream in their life. Everybody needs a dream in their life. If not, you're kind of like just drifting along, right? Uh, you need this dream because without this dream, you can't live purposely. You can't live without having power in your life and stuff like that. So we need to, to encompass who we are with this dream. If not, you're just kind of going through the motions each and every day. We all need dreams. And everything you see that's been created around you started with somebody's dream, started with an idea. Every piece of art, every business that's been developed, even you sitting here tonight came up and out of a dream. And so we all need to know that we need to be dream makers, right? We need to be dreaming because that's how God has created us. Now, I have spent all of my life being what I call a dream maker. I have encouraged people to, to find and fulfill their calling in life, to discover that God-given dream, that purpose that he places inside of you, and to, you know, to really expand on that and, and to do the hard work of finding out what is that and going for it. Now, for every one person that catches that idea, there are nine that are afraid to even begin that process. And so my prayers for you tonight is that you don't let this fear keep you back from being able to, to understand the dream that God has for you because he loves you, you matter to him, right? To understand that dream and to know that no matter what obstacles come in your way, that God's gonna help you to push push through those. So tonight, what do I want to do? I want to talk to you about how to face those things in your life that are big giants that keep you from the dreams that he has. And I want to show you these by pulling out a story that a lot of us heard when we were kids from 1 Samuel 17. It's the David and Goliath story, okay? So I'm going to use that as a backdrop, and I'm going to pull out some principles to show you how you can defeat those giants that are you're facing and become victorious and being able to follow the dream that God has placed in your heart. Are you in for that? Yeah? Okay. Well, why don't you bow your heads for me? And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come more. Father God, I thank you that you are here. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would uh, just shake off any tiredness, Lord, and the whole week and all the things that have gone on, and that you would cause us, Lord, to be attentive to what it is that you are saying. I thank you, Lord, that you want us to be victorious people. I thank you, Lord, that you have gifts. Yes, I see that you have dreams that you have deposited in the hearts of those that are hearing what your Spirit's saying. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you remove any obstacles today, Lord. Do the very work that you spoke to me earlier. Come and have your way in this service. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that without you, without your power, these are just empty words, but with you, we can accomplish everything, Father. So come now, Holy Spirit, and just have your, have your way here. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, well, I do want to talk to you about this story with David and Goliath. I don't want to go back and just recount everything, but just to kind of, you know, when I say about David and Goliath, I know a lot of people go right to that when David, you know, took a sling out and he slew the giant, right, Goliath. And so they think and they kind of stay in that thought. But I really want us to peel back there and I want to look behind the scenes. What was going on? Why was he uh, able to be victorious at that point of, of confronting Goliath, right? So I want to peel back and kind of show you some of the progression of how he got there and what he had to overcome to get there, okay? Now, a little background on David. Um, there's a man called Samuel, right? And you have in your book, in the Bible, First and Second Samuel, right? This is the guy. There's this man, Samuel, and he's a great religious leader, right? He's a mighty prophet of God. And uh, God talks to Samuel one day and says, hey, Samuel, listen, you know the current king that we have, right? Saul, 
well, he's not doing what I'm asking him to do. He's, he's actually being wicked, so I'm going to remove him, and I'm going to appoint a new king, and I'm going to show you who that is, right? So he asks Samuel to go to Bethlehem to find this guy, Jesse, right now. Samuel doesn't know any of this, but I mean, this is what God's saying to him. Go to Bethlehem, find this guy, Jesse, and then I want you to anoint Jesse's son to become the next, next king. Now, you have to do this in secret, right? This is going to be down the Why? Because Saul is still alive. <laughs> I don't think he would be happy to hear that he's being replaced. So that's a whole story of itself, how Samuel was so very faithful to do this. But anyway, so here you go. Samuel goes to Bethlehem. Indeed, he finds this guy, Jesse, right? And says, hey, do you have any sons? And of course, Jesse goes, do I have sons? I've got eight, <laughs> right? Eight of them. So Samuel goes, I need, I need to meet your sons, all of them. And so he goes with Jesse to his home, and Jesse actually brings in, you know, his eldest son, right, to, to pray to him and say, you know, meet my eldest son, because he thinks that's who's going to get the blessing. And Samuel looks at him, and the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence, comes upon Jesse, I mean, comes upon uh, Samuel, and says to Samuel, no, this isn't it. It's not him. And so Samuel looks at Jesse and says, okay, Jesse, do you have another son? You know, what's number two? So number two son comes in. He prays himself, and he looks at him. And again, God's spirit comes on Samuel and says, no, this isn't it either. Well, he goes, okay, I'll take number three, right? So the third son comes in. Same exact thing happens. God's like, no, this is not the one I want either. Well, this whole thing goes through, you know, sons four, five, six, and seven. And pretty soon, he's gone through all of them, and none of them are what God was asking, you know, to be anointed for the king. So Samuel looks at Jesse and goes, oh, do you have any more? <laughs> and at this point, Jesse says, oh, sure. I have my youngest, the runt of the litter, <laughs> right? He is outside tending the sheep. And so Samuel goes, oh, I don't know. Can you bring him in? You know, he's figuring, okay, maybe he missed it, right? <laughs> Can you bring him in? And the minute that David walks in, the Spirit of God hits Samuel and says, this is who I want you to anoint. This is the one. And so Samuel goes through the motions of anointing David as the new king of Israel. Now, you would think that great and mighty things happen right after this, but it didn't. Do you know what happens? Samuel gets on his little donkey, goes back to where he came from, and the dad turns around and he looks at Jesse, you know, or well, Jesse looks at his son David and says, okay, David, well, <laughs> back to the fields for you right? You've just been anointed king, but it's back to the fields for you to tend those little sheep. And that's what David did. He gets up, he goes back. Now, it looks like in the natural, nothing's happening, but oh, something did happen. What happened was a dream was birthed. In David, a dream was birthed in his heart, right? A dream was birthed in his heart. And that's how God works with us. God whispers your name. He comes to you. And in the quiet places, he tells you these secrets. He tells you things. And he births dreams inside of you. And he gives you purpose for living. And he talks about how your life is going to unfold, you know, dramatically and, and stuff like that. But he doesn't fill in all the specifics. But he births a dream. And I believe he's given a dream for each one of us. And if we're not careful, we can just like glance over it and think that nothing's happening. Or, I, you know, I didn't really hear God. But yet God wants to tell you, yes, he gave you that dream. You put it in your heart. Okay? Now, when David got this dream that was birthed in his heart, he, he didn't have the manifestations of it right away. And it was years before it came to be. He had to actually go through, and I'm going to show you four different uh, giants, as we call them, dream busters, as I call them, that he had to challenge in his life that you and I have to challenge. And they're on your outline. The first one is he had to go through delay. He had to go through delay. You know, God told him that he's going to be the next king of Israel, and then there's this delay. Well, that's how God works with us. He tells us things, but it doesn't automatically come right away. There's a waiting period or a time delay that happens. And in this case, that delay, part of that delay, was his dad's perspective of who, of who David was, right? You know, David, I hear and I see that out of all your brothers, you were anointed king, but you know, I just can't get that. You're just kind of like too inexperienced, you know? You're not old enough. And so dad sends him back to tend the sheep. And we see that here in 1 Samuel 17, uh, 12 through 15, it says, now David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. His older brother, brothers enlisted in Samuel's army. But David was held back to care for the sheep in Bethlehem. So again, showing you that 
The dad is saying, nah, you're gonna be over here, you've got this. So the first barrier that happens in a delay a lot of times is what people's perspectives of us. You know, that, that people, they see us and they see us through their own lens and so a lot of times they try to hold you back from the dream that God's wanting to birth in your life, right? He's try, trying to, they hold you back and, and so this happens often. You know, you might, you might encounter someone and go, oh, well, you're too young or you're too old for that or, or maybe you're not the right gender or how about you're not the right race? You're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough. And so people will always have these, these messages to try to keep you down. That's called discrimination. And it comes in many forms. And you and I need to know that just because somebody pers- you know, projects that on you, that you don't have to take that, right? You need to break through that barrier. And those kinds of thoughts that people can have of us can cause us to be delayed in being able to do what God has called us to do, to be able to have that dream birth inside of you. And I tell you, the saddest thing is when the people you love most that are closest to you, when they seem to pull you back down or they can't, uh, they can't see it in you, it really, it is very hard, isn't it? It is. It's just like David having his dad, Jesse, not be able to see this. But yet, Jesse loved David, okay? But he couldn't see it. Listen, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He's got a dream. He's birthing it in you, and he wants it to come about and he's not going to uh, let anybody take that away from you, no matter what their perspective is of you, right? God wants you to know that he's placed that in your heart. And he's saying, be like David. David, even though he was put back in the, in the field, he didn't take that as a, a knock. I'm not going to go after what God has for me. I, you know, I, I can't do this. And nobody's giving me a leg up. You know, people are discriminating against me. I'm too young. He didn't do all that. What he did is he said, no, I'm going to put my my whole heart into the job that I have, tending sheep, and I'm gonna do exactly what my dad is asking me to do, and I'm gonna let God take care of it for me. And God indeed did that. God moved different circumstances to put David right in a place where he could go ahead and continue to grow in the dream that God put in his heart. David's not doing this, God's doing this. So what happens is Jesse, his dad, He wants to get the food to his sons, and back then you had to take care of your family even when they're on the battlefield. So he's gonna send little David, pull him out of the field again, gives him food, and sends him on his way to bring the food to his brothers, and it's there while he is in that place where he's watching this uh, perspective of battle going on. It's in there that he sees this big giant of a man called Goliath coming and taunting the Israelites and, and kinda challenging them, you know, God's people, right? and saying, oh, you're nothing, and we're gonna you know, beat you up, and we're gonna kill you, enslave you, and it's actually, David notices it paralyzes everybody around, around him, and so all the people are running away, and you'll see that as the story unfolds here. So the second barrier that we run into that we see now is discouragement. That's what we're gonna look at next, discouragement. So in the story, Goliath, as I said, he's created this climate of fear for the Israelites, And they've concluded that they're going to lose the battle and they're going to get beat and there's nothing they can do about it. Look what it says in 1 Samuel 17, 8 and 10. It says, each day Goliath would stand and shout at the ranks of the Israelites' armies. Why do you come out here and line up for the battle? Choose one man to fight me. If If he's able to kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I kill him, you become our subjects and serve us. Day after day, day after day, Goliath taunted them, saying, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, everyone was deeply shaken and paralyzed with fear. Was paralyzed with fear. So fear has has now been bred into the Israelites, and they're immobilized, they can't move, they're terrified, right? Have you ever had something like that in your life, where the situation seems so big, you know, and everybody's perspective around you is just so hopeless that you can feel yourself seizing up? Yeah, I have, I have. Well, maybe you you could hear this at work, you know, for some of you where, you know, the office is like, oh, we're not gonna make any gains this quarter because, you know, it's this economic downturn, you know, it's a problem, nobody's selling anything, and, you know, this company, if it doesn't turn around, is gonna go on the tubes, and and so what happens is that kind of runs through the office and everybody's getting discouraged, and pretty soon they convince themselves this is a hopeless situation. I've seen that, I've seen it firsthand. You know, sometimes group consensus about something that's going on is not, it's not a good thing. It's really not. And it doesn't help you to defeat. It doesn't help you defeat the giants that are facing you. And listen, 
You know, um, in my time of prayer, I know that every one of you, not just some of you, every one of you have giants in your land. Every one of you have things that challenge the very nature of who God made you to be, the very dream that he's given you. And so what I hear God saying, if I got this right, <laughs> I hear God saying that he's gonna give you an opportunity to do battle tonight even with that. If you will risk take, he will give you the ability to defeat these giants that you're facing. And by the way, there's not just one giant, there's another one to come and another one and another one. And he's trying to teach you how to be a child of the God most high. And so he's asking you, you know, will you risk take? Will you go after trying to solve uh, how to defeat those giants in your, line, in your life? Now guys, there are solutions that are out there to help you. And a lot of times when we get so caught up in our own stuff, we can't see them. That's why it's so important to have an outside perspective of it. That's why these people that come up here for prayer, you know, that, that offer help, it's not that they're more holy. <laughs> it's they have an outside perspective. They're not in your problem. And they know what God's word says, and so they can pray that over you. Just like I can talk about stuff, uh, you know, about giants and how God takes care of us, because I have fresh eyes. I'm not in the day-to-day -day that you are in. And so I'm kind of like calling out saying, you know, just like David, we need to just break through the, the status quo that says stay in your seat, don't respond, you know, or it's got to all be in here, don't show any emotion. Oh my gosh, no. Life was meant to be emotion-filled, okay? You know, so you need to embrace that part and say, okay, God, I want your help. I don't have it all together, and I'm asking you to come help me. And let me tell you, the Israelites that were there that were so terrified. You know why they were terrified? Because they were letting Goliath set the tone of what was going on, telling them, I'm gonna beat you, I'm gonna do this to you, I'm gonna do that to you. And so they were listening to the wrong voice and it gets inside. So that's a word for some of you. You got some wrong voices of people around you and they're, they're bringing fear into your heart and you need to push away from that. You need to make sure that the voices that are coming at you are not doing that, they're encouraging you. Something like the ladies retreat, that helps when we can get around a group of women that love God, and I know that can be scary, girls, but here you go, when you, when you step across that line and you say, God, I want you so much, and I need, I need what you have for me, you know, it's those times that we yoke up with people that can actually break through some of the giants that you're facing, some of the fears. Now, in 1 Samuel 7, 23 and 24, it says, as David talked with his brothers on the front line, he saw Goliath starting shouting, his usual threats to the Israelite army, okay? When the army heard Goliath, they all ran away. Group senses, unsafe, let's run, right? And so it was David with those outside eyes that says, no, I'm not gonna let discouragement come upon me like that. And so he does battle with it, and he stands up, and he says, no, I'm going to dare to see something differently. And that's gonna hurdle him right into the next giant that a lot of us have to face, and it's disapproval, okay? Disapproval. When we go after what God tells us uh, to do, to go after the goal or the, the, the dream that he's placed inside of us, we meet with disapproval. And I tell you, here's the problem here. Most people will not go after their dream because they don't want to be rejected. They don't want to be disapproved of, right? And so they get fearful of man and it pushes back their ability to go for what God has asked them to do. I know I've had these battles myself. You see, David's own brothers, as we see in this story, his own brothers, you know, come at him and they question his motives and they, they, uh, they disapprove of him wanting to stand up and say, no, Goliath, you don't get to talk to God's people this way, right? And we see that in this conversation here in 1 Samuel 17, 28 and 29. David asks, what's the reward for killing this Philistine and ending this disgraceful abuse? So he's like, I'm not taking this crap. <laughs> like that. When David's older brother heard this, he burned with anger at David and said, why are you even here anyway? Why aren't you taking care of your uh, scrawny little sheep, <laughs> flock of sheep, you know? You crotchety little brat. And so you could just almost hear the disdain, right? The, the rivalry of the brothers there. I know how conceited you are. Now, this is David's response. Now, what have I done, right, said David, can't I even ask a question? Now, I, I brought that in because I like that because that's how our families work, don't they? Yeah, at least in my home that does, right, with my boys. You know, there's this rivalry that goes on and it seems like the people that we live with the most, 
sometimes have the hardest time allowing God's uh, gifts or God's dreams come about, you know? They can't imagine that you could have something because I couldn't have it or I couldn't do that, so of course you can't do that. And, and yes, they know all your flaws also, right? So they, you meet with disapproval, your friends or your spouse or your boss or your teacher or your parent. And so there's this disapproval. But let me tell you, when God places a dream inside, it's so powerful is so powerful, and when you dare to step outside of yourself and you start to go for it, I'm gonna tell you that people will take issue with you. They will try to malign you, they will try to keep you down, and you'll be misunderstood, and you just gotta know you're not gonna meet everybody's approval, and you gotta decide in your heart what matters more, doing what God says or getting people's approval. And you're gonna have to make that decision. I know, I've walked this walk and I'm talking today, you know? I had to decide a long time ago that I wanted the approval of God more than I wanted people's approval. You see, my primary love language is uh, words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, that means well done, good, you know, people saying really nice things and kind of, that, that's my language of love and so that's what I'd like to look at. And then God sends me into a field, which is primarily men, <laughs> right, and stuff, and then I've had to evolve knowing that it doesn't matter what everybody thinks. It only matters for the one, what my Father in heaven thinks. And I tell you, you have to fight that fight to, to uh, not get sucked up into needing people's approval. And it's not that, that you don't receive it. It's, you just can't live off it. It can't be so important because God doesn't want that. He only wants to be the number one in your life. He wants you to focus at him and not be fearful of people. Right? So this whole idea of approval is something that God is calling out and saying, he doesn't want that in your life. He doesn't want that. It doesn't mean don't love people, don't respect people. It means don't look to them to feed what inside that only he can feed you. You see that? All right. The next dream buster that David faces and that we face is the giant doubt. <laughs> the giant doubt, right? Doubt is when we go, gosh, God, did you really call me to this? You know, can I really do this thing that you're, that you're birthing inside of me, this dream that you've given me, you know? And in David's case, I love it, because even the expert tells him, no, you can't do this, you know? Saul, right, when Saul hears about this kid that wants to go ahead and take on Goliath, the, the very Goliath that's paralyzed all of his men, right? He's, uh, he goes, well, gosh, I, I need to meet this kid, right? So he invites him over, and there's this conversation that goes on, and it's in 1 Samuel 17, 32 and 33. It says this, don't worry about a thing, David told the king. I'll fight the Philistine, <laughs> right? And what we could say is cockiness, it really isn't. It's David has so much confidence in his God. He has so much confidence in his God. And then this is Saul, the expert's remarks. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. There's no way you can go against the Philistine. There's only, you're only a boy, and he's been a professional warrior all his life. So the expert's going like, there's no way here, kid. Get out of town, right? You can't do it. Yet, when we're faced with that, when authorities tell us, or somebody that we respect, an expert says, you know, you can't do it, kid. Get out of here. You're not smart enough. You're not gifted enough. You're not talented enough. Let me tell you something, when people tell us that. I'm gonna tell you a little secret too. Experts are not always right. And they're especially not right when they're not listening to the Lord. They're especially not right when they don't listen to the Lord. So how do we overcome that then? How do we, how do we uh, become the type of people that follow after the dream that God has placed in our heart? How do, we, how do we do that? How do we defeat the giants that would come against that? Well, there's a pattern I see uh, in the scriptures, and I'm gonna share it with you, and then we're gonna do some prayer. Here's the pattern, how to defeat giants in your, in your land, right? No matter what they are. And here you go, I'm gonna do a little exercise. This is just something I feel like I just got dropped in my head, which could be dangerous. <laughs> All right, here's what I'd like to do. The, the giants that you're facing, you put the initials down, you put the thing down right on the corner of your paper as I'm, as I'm going through these, okay? This is the way I want you to defeat that that very thing that you feel like is keeping you back from being what God has told you to be. Whatever that thing is that holds you from being able to achieve the, the dream that God has placed in your heart, whatever that thing is, I want you just to dare to write it down if you know it. Just put it in the corner. Now listen and, and run through these with me. 
Ready? The first one is, you and I, we've got to remember how God has helped us in the past. That's the first one. We have to remember how God has helped us in the past. And that seems like, oh, you know, so simple, but it's a, it's a profound truth, guys. It's huge, just huge here. We have to remember how God has helped us in the past. Because what happens is, when I go back and you go back and we remember how God has been there, it rises up inside of us all kinds of confidence. You see, when you and I recall and we remember how God has come through for us, it just builds us like nothing else to be able to do what we're in the moment and to be able to have future sight on things, all right? So we have to remember that when we felt like those places, I see that, when we felt those places where we had no way we're going to be able to handle this thing, you know? We're just not going to make it. It's going to crush us. And then you remember how God got you through that? Okay, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Or when you thought, I'm at the end of my rope. I can't do anymore. And then God says, here's a new rope for you now, right? By the time that you felt like you're so lonely that you're just going to be crushed. And I feel that as I say that because I think there's some of you that really battle with that. And you just feel like you're going to be crushed. Well, I want you to know that God has never left you, nor will he forsake you. He loves you. You're important to him, and, and he's going to come alongside of you again and help you. But you've got to remember all those times in the past that he's done that for you. Again, God is there for you. And in David, we see uh, this interchange that goes on where, where David reaccounts what God has done in the past so that gives him the courage to do what he's doing. And we see that in 36 of 1 Samuel 17. In protection, this is what David is saying when he was uh, a shepherd. In protecting my sheep, I killed both a lion and a bear. The Lord, the Lord, not David, the Lord who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will surely now deliver me from this Philistine too. Confidence. He's got confidence to take on this huge giant of a man that everybody else is terrified. Why? Because he remembers how faithful God has been in the past. And so he uses that to build his confidence to be able to speak out truth. So in defeating giants, we need to go back and look at what God has done in the past and bring that to the forefront of our remembrance, especially when we're trying to defeat something big in your life. The second is we need to be able to use the tools that God has put in our hands we use the tools that God has given me now. You use whatever you have now. You know, a lot of us can get caught up in, well, once I become educated, when I get more money, you know, when I get more connections with people or, or whatever the, the thing is, you know, we think, well, I'll just wait. When that opportunity comes, then I can, you know, unfold to, to do what I need to do. Well, no, the call is to use what you've got in your hands right now wherever you are today, to start going forward with the dream that God's put in your heart. You know, as a young woman, uh, when I first got out of college, I remember sitting on the back porch talking to my mom, and I had moved out. You know, I was just trying to get independent and stuff. I had so many ideas, so many dreams. And I remember moaning to her saying, but gosh, I'm young, and nobody will give me an opportunity to show them what I could do, you know? All this knowledge I have, and I have no more money now to get more skills and to open more doors. And, and so I was telling her all the things I can. I'm like, I'm waiting for my ship that's not coming in. And I can remember my mom just kind of broke through. And she said, Sharon, quit waiting and go out and swim and meet it. <laughs> and I thought, well, what's she talking about? And she's saying to me, use what you got, girl. Whatever you've got, you go and you use it. Use whatever you see in your hands and, and don't worry about it. You know, and if you can't find somebody to buy your time, to buy the things, then you go give it away. You create a market. And so what you hear me saying is that you use the very things that are in your hands to be able to, to continue the things that God has placed in your heart to birth those dreams. That's what David did. And I want you to see this. Uh, when he goes and he's talking to Saul and they're, they're discussing him going out to, to slay the, the giant, right, here, uh, Saul does something I think is pretty ridiculous. He says, hey, I want to give you my armor. So he, like, dresses David up in all this armor. Of course, I mean, David's little. Saul's big, right? <laughs> You're talking a little boy, big man. And so it's kind of ridiculous. And I want you to hear what David does in response, though, here. In verse 38 from 40, it says, Then Saul dressed David in his own armor. But David said, I cannot go out in these because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Courageous. He took them off. Instead, he chose five smooth stones for his sling. So David said, here, I, if you're going to fight, you're going to fight like this. And then David 
actually had to realize, no, that's not how God cut me from the cloth he cut me from. That's not the tools he put in my hands. What he put in my hands was a sling, and so he used what he had, what God had been nurturing him and growing him up in. And that's a word for some of you, that in fulfilling your dream, God has not called you to be me or to be somebody else. He's called you to be you, and he's put things in your hands, and you have to be okay with using whatever tools he's given you, all right? And you need to go out, and you just need to bloom and well do it. All right, so the second thing is you use the tools that God has given you. The third one is I must ignore the dream busters. You just got to ignore them, period, end. Um, you are going to have dream busters, people that are going to try to pull you down, as I talked about earlier, and it's amazing to me that David's going out doing this courageous thing and nobody has encouraged him, not his dad, you know, not his brothers, not even the, uh, you know, the soldiers that were afraid, not even the king who his whole, you know, his whole, um, oh gosh, his whole reputation was on the line. He didn't even care. You know, nobody was encouraging this kid. So what did David do? Well, David encouraged himself. And I love that. David encouraged himself. In 1 Samuel 36, it says this, when others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now I want you to circle, in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. That's something that we need to do. When we don't have people around us that are championing us and encouraging us, then we need to be able to encourage ourselves. Now how do you do that? Because you reaccount what the word says and you reaccount what God says to you and the dream that he's placed in your heart. And it's there that you start to have courage again. It's there that you find uh, the courage to go forward, right? And so you have to really push back from the dream busters and encourage yourself. And I tell you, this is a lot more than just positive talking, okay? Uh, it's a lot more than just having a, a positive mental uh, you know, mindset here. Those things are important, yes. Because what's the flip side of not being positive? Being negative, who wants that? <laughs> not me, right? But what I'm talking about here, when I'm talking about um, encouraging yourself in the Lord, it goes so much more, it's so much deeper than just positive self-talk. It really is. It's, it's when you are faced with a problem and you know that it's so significant and you don't really have the people around you to, to encourage you or you can't hear them because they might be there to encourage you, but you can't hear them. It's at that time that you need to know how to be able to, to self-feed, that you need to be able to go to that place if you're a believer and say, Lord, I need your help. I need you to talk to me here. I need you to tell me. And, it, and again, uh, this is not, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow. It's not that. This is about going to the Lord and saying, I need your help. You see, I know personally that when you are in those really dark places, those places that you just hurt so much, it doesn't help to tell yourself, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, <laughs> put on a smile, you know, do the little dance. It, it doesn't work. But it's in those places, and as I said, I have been here where I've known great loss it's in those places when we turn to the Lord and we say, God, I can't even help myself. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and you encourage me? Would you come and talk to me? It's in those places that I really feel and sense that God galvanized his voice in me and he'll galvanize it in you. What Satan meant for evil, God will use for good. Becoming a victorious person and not a victim happens when we turn and we encourage ourselves in what the Lord has to say to us. You see, this is what God is about. And so we need to know that we ignore people that are telling us don't live the dream that God has put in our heart. And we need to be able to pull ourselves up and talk the self-talk that God has placed in us, the words that he has given us, what his word in the Bible says. And then lastly, the fourth thing that David did to royal model to us how to defeat the giants in our land is number four, I expect God to help me for his glory. I expect God to help me for his glory. That's right, and that's what David did. You know, he went after his dream, but he had to have a faith factor, and that's where this thing comes in to being. It's for God's glory, so you believe God's gonna move for you. First Samuel 17, 45 and 47 says, David shouted to Goliath. I love this. You gotta love this kid. David shouted to Goliath, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Today the Lord will conquer you. He didn't say, I'm gonna conquer you. He said, today the Lord is gonna conquer you. And the whole world will know that there is a God. And everybody will know that the Lord doesn't need weapons to rescue his people. It is in the battle, not your, it's in the, it is his battle, not yours, and the Lord will give you to us. So David is saying, 
I am not afraid. I am able, well able to, to push in and to do the things I need to because I know my God. I expect him to be there, and he's going to be there. He's going to be there because that's what he does. Now, guys, um, I know as I'm saying this, people will wrestle. They wrestle with all kinds of stuff. Like I said, that little name on the end, and, and uh, I know without knowing each and every one of you personally, I know this, unless you expect the Lord to move on your behalf, he will not. You have to expect it, right? You've got to know that God wants to break through and do, do some great and mighty things. It says in the scripture, according to your faith, according to your faith, which says to me that we have so much uh, choice in life as what happens around us and how we take on these, these giants. And so I want you to know that that God wants you to be victorious. Do you believe it? Do you believe it enough to act on it? That's the question. Do you believe that God will help you to take down the Goliaths in your life? Now, there are some of you, and you are far from God, and you're like, wow, man, this is wow talk here. <laughs> Listen, God knew you were going to be in here, and he knew you were going to hear what I had to say today. Listen, and he told me that I need to give you an invitation to come home, to be with him, to be in his family, and that only comes through the salvation of Jesus Christ. That's the only way it comes. And in a moment, when I close in prayer and we're gonna do some things, um, yeah, I'm gonna pray a prayer for you. And I'm gonna invite you to pray it with me. And it's all between you and, and the Father God, and I encourage you to pray that prayer. But listen, I know the Holy Spirit's here and I know he wants to work, so I'm gonna have you guys stand up. We are gonna, remember I said about risk taking, right? All right, I'm going to have my uh, prayer people come on up front. These prayer people, like I said, they're just ordinary people, but they're an extension of what I've been saying. They have been fasting and praying and asking the Lord to break through on your behalf. And that's why they're up here, okay? I've asked them to come up and, and um, yeah, okay, Lord. And so I'm going to go into prayer. And what I felt like the Lord was saying to me was that, there are groups or there are things out there. Yeah, there are groups of you. I'm going to use that word, groups of you, because God, I don't know another one. And you fight. You're fighting different things. And as I've been touching on those points, things have been popping up, and God wants to talk to you about those. Okay? And so I'm going to ask you to be brave. If those are things that, that you feel like you're wrestling with when I start to pray, I want you to come up, walk forward, just go right up, and this is a nice guy right? This is a beautiful woman. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to say, what they want to do is they want to love on you. You see, we're a community of faith, and we got to lean on each other. We just do. That's been my heart for you guys. You can feel the passion, okay? Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are present, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you show up best in weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so, Father, um, yeah, I just ask that you'd have your way, Lord. I know the time. I know where we're at, Father. But I never want to rush you, Lord. Mm. But those of you that I spoke to earlier that are far from God, I don't want to go forward without praying with you. So right where you're at, you can pray this prayer. It's called the, the prayer of salvation. And it lines you back up to follow the Father. And so all of us that have prayed that prayer, you'd be praying for those that are making that decision right now. And if that's you and you want to pray this prayer, just pray it right out loud. Just say, Father, man, have I screwed up. But I accept your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask for forgiveness. And I ask that you would become the leader of my life, Jesus. I don't understand everything, but I know I want to be with you in that personal way. Now, Lord, for those that pray into that prayer, I just thank you that you sealed it in their heart and that you wrote their name in the book of life. And I thank you for that, Lord. Yes. So, Holy Spirit, okay. Father says that there's some of you, you don't even have a dream. I've been talking about a dream, and he says, 
you don't even know anything about it and you're like, whoa, 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 I miss, I miss something. So I'm going to pray for those that feel that angst right now. In the name of Jesus, I ask that the Holy Spirit would begin to show you today from this day forward that he has indeed placed a dream in your heart and that is yours and yours alone to go after. Father, would you make it so clear that they would know that? Now, I thank you for them, Father. I thank you for that. Yes, Lord. And I see this whole idea of delay. I hear, how long, oh Lord? How long do I have to be here? How long am I going to be in this marriage that's like this? I see that. I see that. How long? How long before my ship comes in? And I feel like the Lord is saying, saying that you need to swim out. To swim out and meet it. That faith point of swimming out. So if you have this heart cry that says, I just can't take this delay in my, my finances and yeah, mostly in your marriage. Those two things, I see it. How long you called me and yet it's not there. Father says he hears your voice, he hears that cry and he invites you to, to come and that he wants to minister to that. He wants to, that's a giant. That's a giant. And so, Father, I just ask now that those that wrestle with this whole delay issue, Lord, that you would bring freedom and that you would cause them to have courage, Lord, to grab hold of the community of faith and say, would you walk with me? Would you come with me until I get that answer? Yes. And then I hear discouragement also. The time has passed. The mountain is too big. That child is too far away. The father says, no. No, it's not. And he wants to renew your hope. I see that. He wants to renew your hope. And if those are some of the things you're struggling with, God says, let me speak into your life. Let me give you renewed hope, renewed vision, let me push away the voices that tell you that you cannot. God says, I want to break in there. Yes, Father. And then I hear the disapproval. The disapproval. But, oh, Sharon, I'll be without love. I'll, I'll be without... And God says, no, you will never be without love. If you will challenge that very thing, he says he's going to rush in and he wants to pull you right out of that. You cannot go forward unless you uh, take on that, that giant of, of needing people's approval to move forward. And God wants to break through that and you have to confess it. You need to say, that's me. Oh my gosh. That's me. God wants to set you free, but he he needs for you to be able to say, that's me. Remember, it's according to your faith that you can accomplish all things. And then I also hear doubt. God, I have this huge dream. I hear it. I have this huge dream on my heart, and it seems so big, and, and I think it can't be from you because I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. I, I, I just can't. The Father said, indeed, he has given you that dream in your heart. It's not you're crazy, and it's not because you have grandiose ideas. It's because he dreams big. He dreams big, and he's placed that in your heart, and he wants you to vocalize it. He wants you to, to send it back out. He wants you to tell somebody, not to be convinced why not, but to say, this sounds crazy, but this is what it's in my heart so that we can acknowledge it. So it's like a little seed that falls into the ground and then it can grow up big. I said, unless it goes into the ground and is planted, it cannot grow. I said, Father, those that you've given these big dreams that have doubted you, I ask, Father, that you'd give them courage even now, Lord, to begin to tell people about what it is, that they wouldn't just right, run away and think, ah, not today, but that they would take it on, Lord. Now, Holy Spirit, you've been uh, just moving on me this whole past week. You've bothered me to no end. It's because you love your people. 
It's because you love your people, Father, and I know it. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and that you do what I cannot do. You have the power. You have the ability. It's only through you that change is embraced and change is able to be tackled. And so, Holy Spirit, come now and cause your people to look towards you and you alone, Lord. Yes, cause them to be able to embrace in the community that you've placed them in. Now, Father, bless those that had ears to hear what you're saying. Bless those, Father, that are risk takers. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that you are faithful. You always have been faithful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.